discussed briefly the drivers of agricultural growth and food security. We talked about the scenario modeling methodology that we utilize in, the, in this talk. Then I'll, I'll show some of the results for climate change impacts on agriculture, both globally and for India. Uh, then look at some estimates of climate change adaptation costs that we've done, and then draw out some conclusions uh, and policy responses. So I think one point I want to make today is that climate change is important. It's not the only thing going on out there. In fact, it, it may be less important in some ways than some of the other drivers. But, so in addition to climate change, some, uh, water and land scarcity uh, and quality are, are going to be a, a, a huge determinant of, of future food security. On the water side, you're seeing a rapid demand in the non-agricultural sectors, actually moving water away from agriculture and into the uh, urban and uh, domestic and industrial uses. Uh, and of course, as you see in India, the, the tremendous amount of overdraft of, of groundwater uh, which uh, is uh, not sustainable for food production. Land scarcity, uh, uh, there's really only uh, significant potential to expand crop production in, uh, in Latin America, mainly Brazil and Argentina, and in parts of Africa. And, and in Africa, that land expansion is into relatively poor quality, low yielding land. Yeah. Uh, on the positive side, some of the key drivers, of course, are, go are going to be investment in agricultural research and improved crop varieties uh, that, that can respond to climate change, water scarcity, and others, and I'll talk about those in more detail later, as well as science and technology policies, which is one of the key areas that ILSI works on in terms of di uh, discovery, development, delivery. Uh, how do you, once you've got a, a variety, a good variety out of the research process, what do you do with it? How do you get it out to the farmers? And also in, uh, part of that is intellectual property rights, regulatory systems, uh, and extension. On the demand side, it's going to be another big, big driver, of course, of, of future food security. Uh, the projections are now that we'll have 9 billion people on the earth in 2050. There's about seven, just over 7 billion uh, today. And there's a very rapid process of urbanization, with moving from about half urban today to nearly 80 percent urban in, uh, in 2050. And in the next slide, I'll talk a little more about the implications uh, of that, together with uh, income growth. And, Obviously, the world isn't growing that quick, fast now. The economies are fairly, are fairly slow growing now, but the long-term prospect is for, for a restarting of growth, uh, significant growth in Asia. And now increasingly now in Africa, there's going to be substantial GDP growth, uh, putting de demand pressure on, on food. Uh, the, there's a relatively low level of consumption in Africa now, so they have a high propensity to consume more food out of, uh, uh, out of gro income growth, and that, that will be a major boost in the future as well. Uh, oil prices, biofuels, and bioenergy together are also uh, putting a significant competing uh, uh, competition for food in terms of land area. Uh, I'm not a, it's quite totally negative about biofuels as some people are, some analysts. Uh, I think there is a potential of the future, but it, it will require greater investment in agriculture productivity growth to meet the needs of both biofuels bio, uh, and uh, food. There's also going to be increasing demand for greenhouse gas mitigation and carbon sequestration, as well as in the uh, conservation of biodiversity. Some of these are, are, have good uh, synergies with, with food production and growth. Things like uh, conservation and agriculture, no-till, can provide both improved yields and, uh, and also uh, GHD uh, and carbon mitigation. But other, uh, for other things, for example, if you ha we have to significantly cut nitrogen use to reduce uh, emissions uh, of nitrous oxide, that will have a negative impact on, uh, on future food production and growth. On, on the, in terms of the rapid uh, income growth and urbanization, it, it not only affects the total amount of food demanded, but is, is having dramatic changes on, on, on diets. Uh, with you shift it to convenience foods, fast foods on the negative side, but also some increases in fruits and vegetables on the more positive side. Uh, there also tends to be a greater demand for sugar, fats, and oils, uh, which is also, of course, leading to a, an opposite problem of obesity, even in many developing countries. Uh, one of the key factors, though, is, is the rapid growth in meat consumption and the, therefore demands uh, of grains for feed. And our own projections, that, uh, and, and others are fairly similar to this, is that half of the growth in future grain or cereals demand will be for livestock. So it'll be a, a large portion of future grain demand for, will be maize uh, and other coarse grains for livestock. 
Again, this adds to the uh, intense pressure on land and water. So now we're going to look at how we look out forward in terms of how the impact of climate change on top of these other drivers will affect uh, uh, food security. We basically have a, a series of linked models. We start with uh, GC, the general circulation models for, cli for climate scenarios. Of course, these are done by others. We don't do them. We're, we're consumers of them. And, and we, we do a number of different GCMs, and, and I'm focusing today on the IPCC uh, A1B scenario. Uh, uh, and then we take that and downscale uh, temperature and rainfall uh, regionally uh, around the world. We have a spatial allocation model at, at IFPRI that, that has developed detailed um, mapping of, of crops based uh, around the world based on crop calendars, soil ca characteristics, and climate. Uh, it, and that sets up the, the spatial disaggregation that we need to analyze climate change. Then finally, then we have the DSAT crop model. Uh, we heard a little bit about that yesterday, which does biophysical crop responses to temperature and precipitation. And finally, we take it through to IFRI's impact global food supply and demand model. And I'll talk a little bit more about those two. So DSAT models, briefly, they, they estimate, we use those to estimate the biophysical responses to climate change. So, these models al allow you to, to estimate the impacts of, of temperature and precipitation, while also uh, uh, holding, uh, taking account of soil characteristics, nitrogen, CO2 fertilization. So we do those at, at crop-specific locations. At the pixel level, you can see we have, have to solve these at a huge number of, of pixels around the world. You can see the, the number for each of the various crops. Uh, we then take those, those shocks, the, those, we, so we estimate the impact uh, on crop yields uh, from DSAT for all the major crops. We then put those shocks into an economic model, which is the, the impact mo model, to see how, how that determines economic and, and food security outcomes. And the impact methodology is, it's, is the global uh, ag sector model with 46 commodities. Uh, we, we cover 150 countries and, and combinations of countries, and also do down, also do within country uh, river basin analysis, analysis within each one. So, so we determine not only supply and demand for food, but world prices on an annual basis. Uh, we take account also of global hydrology and water demand, and I'll show you in a moment how we do that. And as I said, the yield and area impacts from climate, biophysical climate change impacts are incorporated through the DSAT model. Just very briefly, I won't go in detail, but you can see, for example, for, for each country, we have, uh, we estimate supply and demand based, again, we do account for the urban growth and changes in the food habits through what's called demand elasticities. Uh, we have income and population growth projections. It could also be varied from different scenarios. On the production side, we have area and yield elasticities with respect to the key prices involved. Uh, as well as underlying growth rates of, of uh, area and yield that then can be modified through the shocks from climate change. As I mentioned, we do also solve simultaneously a water simulation model that determines the amount of water that's available for irrigation. So we, we do take account of the impacts of, of climate change and water through this effect as well. Uh, and we model water demand not only for irrigation, but for livestock, domestic, uh, industrial, and environmental purposes. Uh, uh, and again, that can take into account the climate scenarios. This block in here, we don't have to go into any detail, uh, but that's, that shows how we solve for annual prices, demand, supply, trade, uh, and, and so forth. So let's just jump right into the results now. Uh, I'm going to show you results for uh, a couple of crops and in 2050 and 20, 2080. Uh, Morocco is one of the uh, GCMs, just illustrative purposes to show that. This shows uh, the impact uh, on rain-fed maize of, of climate change in 2050 compared to a no climate change scenario. So this says that in 2050, the yields would be 11% lower in, uh, due to climate change uh, compared to if uh, there was no climate change. As you see at this point, to 2050, uh, India does okay, okay in terms of, uh, it has somewhat increases in, in much of the region, some negatives. But one of the interesting things here is that the, the U.S. Corn Belt get, gets hit really hard, uh, and that helps drive up, drive up uh, prices and reduce uh, the ability of the U.S. to do exports. But look at that, and I'll move on to 2080, and you see here, now you reach turning points in temperatures. 
you see now that the, the red areas, uh, which are yield losses, are greater than 25% uh, compared to the uh, to a no climate change scenario. That's spread really across the glo globe through the tropics, but also up through the United States. Uh, India now has, has extremely negative impacts on maize uh, uh, across almost the entire country as well. You can see a projected 37 percent decline relative to a no climate change impact. Irrigated rice, here we all, to 2050, we see uh, losses in basically in the range of 5 to 25 percent through the whole rice belt of, of, uh, of Asia, in, including India, as you can see, and overall about a 10 percent uh, loss again, 10 to 11 percent in 2050. This goes up again with additional uh, red areas showing so now uh, you get about a 16% loss uh, in rice production by 2080. And look finally at rain-fed wheat, again 2050, you see once again India is getting hit pretty hard in most of the areas, a couple areas uh, do okay, uh, and overall about an 8% loss uh, in, in wheat uh, yields. And finally, again, a, a, a much bigger negative impact when you go out to 2080 and temperatures go beyond uh, threshold uh, effects for, for crop yield. Then what happens, you know, so we feed those kinds of results through the impact model and can look at the impact on international food prices. And of course, food prices are an extremely important measure of food security because you know, with uh, uh, th those in poverty around the world uh, spend a large part of their income on staple food. food. So when food prices go up, they don't only really pay more for food, but the, essentially their real income goes down because of the, of the uh, important impacts there. And the first thing to notice is going back to what I said earlier. If you, first of all, the purple here is, is, is the index year of 100, uh, index of 100 in 2010. The green is uh, 2050 uh, without climate change, and the red is 2050 with, with climate change. And I think the important thing to see here is, I noted earlier, even without climate change, we're in for a period of, we project an in, increasing real prices showing increasing food scarcity in the world. So uh, major impacts even without climate change on, uh, on rising prices. But you can see then those climate change impacts that I showed you for 2050 also result in an additional hit to raise prices even, even more. That also has significant impacts then on calorie consumption. Uh, this shows a number of regions, the, the first one being South Asia. And as you see, we project, even under the baseline again, only slow progress in, in increased calorie consumption, uh, again, because of, of the, these, all these other drivers that are leading to higher real food prices. And then when you hit climate change, you get again another big drop off uh, in, in consumption. Uh, looking at climate change compared to non-climate change, we see about a 12% decline in calorie consumption in developing countries uh, due to climate change in 2050. We then have uh, estimations of the, Im of the relationship between childhood malnutrition, calorie consumption, and a num number of other variables. If we hold those other variables uh, at the baseline projection, we can look at the impact of climate change on childhood malnutrition. And again, uh, you see important results here. Of course, South Asia, as we all know, does tend to have a higher number of, of uh, in, in percentage of child malnourished children than other regions. There's a huge amount of research on that. Uh, that's beyond the, uh, why that is, it's beyond the scope here. But I think what's important to see here is that, again, even in the, the green bar without climate change, I, I'd call this pretty slow progress in reducing childhood malnutrition. I mean, you know, goals of, of having childhood malnutrition within 20 years, as you can see, we're not even getting close to that going out to 2050. And again, climate change uh, makes it even, even a worse situation as shown by those red bars. So, so I mean, obviously this is a strong case that we, we need to do more in terms of agricultural policy and adaptation. And we have one uh, simple uh, definition of agricultural adaptation that we can use in the, with respect to the, uh, uh, in, with, within our modeling system, and that is that what would be the level of investments in the agricultural sector that would reduce child malnutrition with climate change to the level with no climate change? So again, this isn't even to make great progress relative to the baseline, but at least to get us back to that not so great baseline. So in here we have estimates of, of, of agriculture research, irrigation expansion, efficiency improvements, and rural roads. And the way they work in the model is, is that we have 
estimates of the impact of, of how much of a dollar spent on each of these uh, item, uh, these items ha has on agriculture productivity growth and then how that feeds through to, to food security. Uh, and uh, what we find is that depending on which DCM you, we use, the required additional annual expenditures uh, is over $7 billion, that's globally. So currently the investments in these, in these items, uh, in these factors are, is about 10, uh, sorry, $12 billion a year. So this is a big additional increase uh, that's needed. Uh, you can see a little bit of a qualitative uh, differentiation across regions in Sub-Saharan Africa, 40% uh, of the total 40% of that $7 billion is needed in Africa because they're coming from a low level. And for there, it's mainly roads. Whereas here in South Asia, we estimate an initial $1.5 billion per year, a large share of that in India. Uh, and the key areas there, here are the expenditure on research and on irrigation uh, efficiencies. We're, so where do we go beyond just those numbers? What are the policies that, that, that come up forth? Uh, Obviously, what we've, shown, what we've shown here is climate change will have, in fact, negative impacts on ag production and food security in developing countries. And we should further note that agriculture is critical uh, for employment, economic development, and food security. So even beyond the direct production effects, how, how that feeds through to greater employment and economic development will be crucial. Uh, and, and as we show, we need significant new additional expenditures to reduce the adverse impacts of climate change. Uh, one of the key things that arises out of this work and others we've done is, that, though I think, is to make the point that good agriculture development policy is also good climate change adaptation policy. So what you want to do to solve climate change problems is in many cases the same thing you want to do just to, to have a good, ra rapid economic and ag agricultural development. Uh, what climate change does do is, is it's a threat multiplier. The, so for any given development goal, you're going to need greater investments, greater, better policy reforms. Uh, and one of the keys is, as we've heard yesterday also, is to, is to try to get uh, uh, the means to sustainable growth into the hands of farmers to reduce poverty and facilitate uh, adaptation and mitigation. Because there are some differences when you get into climate change. For example, you might shift investments on the margin into more, more into climate sensitive traits, such as uh, and protection against climate variability and extremes, so things like heat to tolerance, drought tolerance, and, uh, and insect uh, resistance. Uh, so where we see uh, some of the uh, most important areas uh, for adaptation policy investments are, are really for breeding crops for these bio, biotic and, and abiotic stresses uh, in, in the agricultural productivity growth, as well as the ability uh, in the agriculture sector to deal with variability and stress due to these, due to better uh, varieties is going to be really a, a key uh, to food security under climate change. Enhanced water control and investment in irrigation came out is very important, but also to, for a future, uh, a future adaptation, not, again, not only for climate change, but climate variability is, is to implement much uh, much better knowledge, information, and risk sharing approaches uh, that support farmers to make flexible adaptations so they have the means to adapt uh, in their own cropping decisions and choices of, of farming systems. In addition, we, I think it is important to keep supporting open trading regimes in agriculture products, not to go into uh, more export bans or, or higher levels of protection or, and tariffs, uh, because we do find that under climate change we need significantly more trade uh, in order to uh, meet the demand, food demand, particularly in Africa, but to some extent in Asia as well. Uh, in areas like water management, we, we should move more to pricing and, and water market approaches, and particularly uh, reducing agriculture subsidies uh, that encourage overuse of inputs and higher carbon. Of course, I, mean, it, I think this is one issue that India needs to deal with better to reduce the very high levels of, of fertilizer, water, and energy subsidies, and, and translate those kinds of uh, subsidies into either direct non-distorting payments to farmers or to uh, productive investments like uh, agriculture research. Land and water rights are important, uh, as well as there. So their uh, ability, uh, improving the ability of farmers at the farm level is also going to be essential. 
Finally, the other is, is again, enhanced rural infrastructure investment, which in, improves access to markets, risk insurance, credit, uh, inputs, and mobile phone towers, again, to better link farmers into the uh, overall economy. Thanks very much.